Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy MLK Day to you and yours. Happy Monday. Happy Martin Luther King's Day. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. I did. Uh, we are going to uh, honor and talk about Martin Luther King Jr. on Wednesday during Tennessee Harmony. We're going to do what we always do on Mondays. We're going to talk NFL football and the importance of the NFL weekend. No slight to Dr. King. I get that America has designated today uh, as the day to honor MLK. We honor MLK pretty much every day on this show. His picture hangs on the wall here. We try to take the good aspects of his ministry and apply them to our conversation. On Wednesday with Pastor Walker uh, and Anthony Walker and with Virgil Walker and Delano, we'll go into a full-blown discussion about the legacy of MLK and what impact it has on American culture uh, right now. But we'll do that on Wednesday today. We're going to talk football with Steve Kim and Jason Brown as we do every Monday. It was a fascinating uh, NFL weekend, a continuation of last year's playoffs. I believe 11 of the last 12 NFL playoff games have been one possession games or less. That's an amazing streak, enough to make you go, hmm, I wonder what they're doing to uh, have all these close games. Hmm, that, this almost feels, ah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to put my tinfoil hat on. I'm just going to enjoy uh, the, the close games and the football weekend. I would have to say from my view, th there were two games that stood out in terms of interest, in terms of intrigue, in terms of like, hey, what's going on here and impact. There were two games more interesting than any other. Los Angeles Chargers surrender a 27 point lead to the Jacksonville Jaguars and everybody immediately turns to speculation about Brandon Staley, the head coach of the Chargers and whether or not he should be fired. I think he should. And then the other game, uh, not so much for anything that happened on the field, but for what didn't happen on the field, Lamar Jackson doesn't even make the trip to Cincinnati to support the Baltimore Ravens and his teammates as they play a playoff game against the Bengals. Not only did he not play, he didn't make the trip to Cincinnati. Jason Lockin Four of CBS says there's some real reasons for concern. If you're a Ravens fan and you want Lamar Jackson to return, Jason Lockin Four has tweeted out he expects, he says the relationship between the Ravens and Lamar Jackson is at an all time low and he expects Lamar Jackson to be playing somewhere else next season. That's fascinating. We'll talk about that and a few of the other playoff games. But uh, we'll start with the uh, Korean Cosell, who I know watched all of the football action uh, this weekend. Uh, Cosell, I want to start with the Chargers because <clears throat> I think the Brandon Staley situation is interesting. I think that game also, beyond Brandon Staley and what he did to cough up that game, not using his running game in the second half, but yeah. – some of the officiating in that game was mind-blowing to me. And so uh, we'll start with the Chargers, Jaguars, and we'll start with Brandon Staley. A lot of candidates for who blew that game, the refs, Joey Bosa uh, with his penalty that ended up leading to a two-point conversion. But I think most people believe Brandon Staley deserves most of the blame. He continues to struggle as a head coach. I think they ran the ball eight times in the second mm -hmm. half. They did nothing to protect that lead and ended up losing the game. But I was reading today, uh, Steve, you probably know Jim Trotter, long yeah. made his bones covering the NFL and the San Diego Chargers for many, many years, knows the Spanos family well. Jim Trotter put together an argument over social media, over Twitter, uh, explaining why he doesn't think the Spanos family is going to fire uh, uh, Brandon Staley. I, I, I disagree with that, but your take on Brandon Staley and what we saw uh, in that Chargers-Jaguars game. Jason, first of all, good Monday to you. Yeah, if Brandon Staley was a cartoon character, he'd be Schlepprock of the Flintstones because he always has bad luck. But, you know, bad coaches create their own bad luck. Even when it was 27 nothing. 
Jason, the thought that I had to myself was this game should be 38 or 41 to nothing. And there's an old saying, kicking field goals or settling for too many of them will get you beat. And when they gave up that late touchdown to make it 27-7, you said to yourself, you know what? It's only a three-possession game. You never know what could happen. And then to not squeeze the clock with Austin Eckler, who's probably an elite player that nobody talks about, right there, that is game and clock management at its worst. And, and the mood around the city, for those who actually care about the Chargers, all two of them, is really bad. And, and you look at Brandon <laughs> Staley. He's going to two extremes here. Last year, he went for it in a playoff situation against the Raiders from his own 20. And, and you're thinking, geez, that, that is incredibly reckless. This year, he went to the complete opposite end of the spectrum by continually passing the ball, and you're thinking to yourself, you've got to squeeze the clock a little bit. And just, look, bad things happen to bad coaches, generally. It, it's not just a coincidence. There's not just coincidences that happen. Sometimes you create your own luck. And I look at that Chargers roster, which was really banged up. So let's go rewind a week, Jason. This actually goes back to the last regular game of the season. Mike Williams and Keenan Allen have not played a lot this year, but when they are together, they're a dynamic duo. And with big boy Herbert back there, that's a team I would hate to face when they have all their parts. There was no reason to play Mike Williams that last week. There was not a single playoff ramification or seeding to that ball game, and you get the guy hurt. That's on the coach. And then he gets snippy with the media when they bring it up. Hey, coach, that's why you're there to manage the club, and he mismanages it. And look, I'll defer to Jim Trotter. He's the NFL insider. He's the one with the relationship with the Spanoses. I'll believe him. But if that is the case, and I'll believe him, that's going to go over like farting in church. It ain't going to go over well. <laughs> so Trotter lists several of the reasons why and again this isn't what he thinks they should do this is his analysis yeah, of what right. the spanos family is going to do and he he goes on to say like sean payton super expensive will want control of the organization spanos is like a system of checks and balances they don't want to turn the franchise they don't want to pay someone 15 20 million dollars a year uh, like Sean Payton they don't want to surrender hmm. draft picks in order to get Sean Payton he goes on to say that in the last 23 drafts uh, the Chargers have had a first round pick they love to keep their draft capital uh, he, he he says that uh, it's not all about money they've seen him spend money but then he goes on to say that uh, they like uh, Staley's leadership qualities, the way he leads, communicates schemes, and carries himself, that means a lot to them. Uh, he ends by saying, no one is happy about the Jags' loss, but I believe ownership is confident that Staley, who finished 9-8 and eight and 10-7 and seven his first two seasons, will continue to grow into the job. He was hired only five years after working as a D3 defensive coordinator and had only one year as an NFL defensive coordinator. Okay. All right. He Hold thinks on. Staley is safe. Yeah. And he might be. Step back, clear the lane. Let me get this off my chest. Isn't this the same organization about 15, 16 years ago fired Marty Schottenheimer after a 14-2 and two season? A guy that had consistently won a lot of games. Yeah, he had bad luck in the playoffs. They fired a coach at 14-2. and two. And I remember Schottenheimer didn't get along with the GM, A.J. Smith. But somehow Staley who ekes into the playoff with one of the better rosters in the league, is safe. Okay, here's the other thing. The Buccaneers years ago hit a wall with Tony Dungy, an excellent coach, a fine man, a Hall of Famer. But they made a decision that to get over the hump in the NFC and beyond, we had to change a few things, namely the offense, and they gave up a little bit for a guy by the name of John Gruden. I would think the Glazer family looks back at that and says, you know what? We love Tony Dungy, but we love our Lombardi trophy a little bit more. That was worth it. Here's another thing. Um, in terms of the perception and the way it plays to the Los Angeles, Southern California public, you have to understand, Jason, 
and you know this because you were there the first couple of years, the Chargers in the Los Angeles sports hierarchy probably are no better than the fifth or sixth most popular entity. We're talking about the Lakers, the Dodgers, USC football, and maybe you have maybe UCLA basketball. Then you have the Clippers. The Chargers remind me of the Clippers back in the 80s, Jason. And I used to see these ads in the LA Times when everyone still read the paper. It would be like mini season ticket packages or bunches of games for the Clippers. It'd be a half page ad. They flipping around, read a little Jim Murray, Alan Mell. And I was like, oh, Clippers. Five games for 70 bucks at the old LA Sports Arena, right? And the funny thing is about that Clippers ad, it would say, come see. Dominic Wilkins with a picture, Larry Bird with a picture, Magic with a picture, Isaiah Thomas. Come see, they would never even show Danny Manning. And it was it's almost like they were just an NBA franchise, were playing way second banana or second fiddle to the Lakers. And that's the Chargers. They still belong in San Diego. I, I'm not lying to you. I only know one diehard Charger fan in my city, Mario Lopez. And that's because he grew up in Chula Vista. <laughs> a suburb of San Diego. <laughs> and I was with them on Saturday. And when they blew that lead, I have not seen Mario that angry since he got into a fight with Zach on Saved by the Bell. So I was just kind of looking at him. And I'm just telling you right now, if you stick with Staley as your coach, which is still a possibility, you're going to further lose this city because there's an a there's an apathy towards Charger football because there's, there's a sense that they don't belong here. And number two, the remaining Charger fans, I think, are going to feel very, very angry and alienated. You mentioned the name, and by the way, Marcellus Wiley would be a Chargers fan living in L.A. Well, he played. But you he mentioned got, got a paid name. By them. <laughs> you mentioned a name that could be a solution. I mean, it would be outside the box. Wouldn't you love to see them hire John Gruden to be their coach? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Now, now hold on. Now you got me interested. <laughs> now, now as Lee Hacksaw Hamilton would say, show me your lightning bolt. Yes, that, that would, but here's the issue. Does that play in woke Peoria? Is John Gruden based on everything that we know and how it transpired and that sudden end to Las Vegas? Is he hireable right now? In your view, honestly, do you think you can get away with it if you're the Spanoses? Oh, if I was the Spanos, if I was the Chargers, I'd hire John. Look, if you're asking me, I'd hire John Hart, yeah. uh, John Gruden in a heartbeat. He didn't do anything wrong. He cracked a joke about Demora Smith, big rubbery lips. He's got big lips. You know, again, it, there's nothing to be ashamed of. I got big lips, not as big as the Demora Smith. I mean, oh, few people do. Uh, <laughs> outside, Angelo wow. Jolie may have big as lips as him, but you know, a few men have as big a lips as. Yeah. as anyway, I would hire wow. the guy Jeez. in a heartbeat. Uh, he did nothing wrong, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows he's not racist. Hey, l let me keep moving because I want to get to this other aspect. <gasps> ESPN wrote a story this weekend, heading into uh, uh, the game about the NFL. And the officiating, I had this story called up, and now I don't know where it's gone. But uh, the NFL and their officiating crisis, basically. The NFL officiating under fire, let's see, under scrutiny after Seahawks-Rams controversy. This was Adam Schefter three days ago heading into the playoff weekend talking about the problems they're having with officiating the NFL. I think everybody that's been following the league knows, like, officiating's been bad for a while and there's always a lot of conversation about officiating but the officiating to me has gone to mm -hmm. a new level in terms of how bad it's gotten and there was suspicious things that went on that ram seahawks game that had huge playoff implications basically knocked the lions out of the playoffs mm -hmm. the whole nine and then this weekend to see oh. this ref sean smith Go after Joey Bosa. This, he, yeah, to see this play uh -huh. here where Joey Bosa's walking away and Sean Smith chases after him, starts a confrontation, and then throws a flag and costs them 15 yards. And you wonder why Joey Bosa at the end of this game is irate and livid and finally snaps. He can't get a call all game. Earlier in the season, back in September, same referee, Sean Smith, 
flag Chris Jones for a sack on Matt Ryan for disturbing language. Chris mm. Jones, the defensive tackle for, and that had a huge impact on that game. Sean Smith, ego, he, he's basically the Joey Crawford of the yes. NFL right now, in my opinion, and, and the NFL has an officiating problem. I felt like the article that Adam Schefter wrote was a hit job directed at Troy Vincent. Troy Vincent's in charge of officiating. The officiating deal, I keep talking about it. The reason why it keeps getting worse is because merit, production, excellence has nothing to do with what's going on with NFL officiating. It's can we install a woman official? Can we uh, uh, install yeah. a black lead referee in all these games? It has no and so everybody's morale is low. No one's getting promoted on competence. And so that's why I think the officiating just keeps getting sloppier and sloppier. Where have you gone, Mike Carey? I, I, I mean, look, you, you bring up Joey Crawford, uh, the referee I'm bringing up. And, and yeah, I admit it. In the 80s, I watched professional wrestling. Danny Davis. Remember Danny Davis? He was always a referee that if you needed a bad call for the wrong guy to win, that would anger the, the audience. It'd be Danny Davis. Anytime Danny Davis was in charge, he was the best money a referee could buy for all the wrong reasons. And yeah, there comes a point in time where I get it. You want to be inclusive, which is a buzzword for you just want to check all the boxes. Pretty soon, look, if we're going to have a Miss Universe that's transsexual, the first transsexual NFL referee, it's going to happen. It's go I'm telling you, it's going to happen. We're going to have cisgender, non-binary referees. It's going to be a mess. In fact, those zebra suits are going to be all colorful like that rainbow flag of theirs. It's going to be a mess. But there come look, in my view, the officiating to me is becoming very suspicious because the nature of the flags that are being thrown, there's nothing players can do to actually avoid it. Like that roughing the passer penalty on Lawrence um, against Kirk Cousins. And I said to myself, uh-oh, here we go. But luckily, the, the ball did not lie. Um, the issue that I'm having with officials themselves who are actually trying to do the best job they can – I think many of them feel the need to referee and officiate for optics. In other words, if a hit looks too bad or if the wrong player is tackled too roughly, we have to throw the flag because not only do they not want to hear the heat over maybe social media, they don't want to get called into the office. But this is my belief, and I said this last night over Twitter. We need to have the football people run football now i don't mean the suits i don't mean the people that haven't played since pop warner unless you actually played college football or nfl and have a skin in this game that knows what it's like to be hit hit across the face to have a concussion i don't want you having any bearing on the rules and the way they are interpreted but unfortunately unfortunately jason that'll never happen They've turned, listen, I, I saw Micah Parsons tweeting about mm. how absurd the officiating has become. They have a credibility crisis with their own players as it relates to officiating. And, and the, the, again, the officials, particularly Sean Smith, have gotten out of hand. It's a power trip. We saw the same thing in the NBA with Joey Crawford and Tim Duncan and just Joey Crawford in general. These guys have become stars. And then when you throw Merritt out and it's, yeah. everybody feels bulletproof and, hey, I'm, I'm a woman or I'm black and there's not, they got to have me and all of the The Troy Vincent corrosive impact that's being felt, and Troy Vincent's the number two guy behind Roger Goodell in the league office. He's basically their diversity, equity, and inclusion guy. Uh, he's a former NFL player. He was with the NFLPA and now with the NFL. They're undermining the league. What, what happened with Joey Bosa? Sir, sir, I know this happens in baseball where umpires might chase after a player. But that has never been the habit no. in football. Th th that's just never no. been a guy says something while walking to the sidelines. You de-escalate. You just let the guy go. Y you know, you don't no. chase him down. What did you say to me? And, and then start some kind of confrontation. Joey Bosa's in a, in a tough spot. He can't defend himself because 
you know, one, it's a black ref, and so, you know, he's vulnerable to the ref saying, oh, no, he called me a racial slur. Or he, he said something, one of the, you know, one of these ten words that we can construe as race. Who knows? But Chris Jones, black dude, went through the hmm. same issue with this Sean Smith. You know, he, he gets into a little argument, Chris Jones does, with, with Matt Ryan. And, and Chris Jones, I mean, and Sean Smith throws a flag for disturbing language. Come on, man, it's football. Mm. C- cut it out. It's ridiculous. All right, I want to move on to potentially the biggest story of the NFL offseason, biggest story of the playoffs. Lamar Jackson mm, mm, mm. does not play this weekend. That's one thing. And there's a lot of people, including RG3 and others, saying, oh, no way he can play. That's what happened to me. I played on a bum knee, and it ruined my career. Well, uh, there's a black quarterback that had a different take on Hmm. Fox Sports' NFL pregame show. I want you to watch this conversation between Carissa Thompson, Michael Vick, Charles Woodson, and Sean Payton about Lamar Jackson. If this team was, you know, Two and 15, I, I can see him not coming yeah. back and trying to finish out the season. It just seems that, you know, we all play this game to try to w- win a Super Bowl. Like, yeah. that's the main goal. And if you have a good a team that's good enough to get to the playoffs and... You guys, we're it, not what, having what, this conversation, it, that contract. It, it, you're not having a con- Like, you're three games I understand, you know, he's playing the game. I don't know if I would have the balls to do it. I'm, I'm being yeah, real honest with you. Like you know, to sit out. Say, but kudos to him. I mean, he's, he's about his business. He, he figures they, they don't want to pay him. So, but like but, Coach say, like you just said, it's the playoffs, man. You three, yeah. game, you three yeah. games away. Put a brace on it. Mm. Get it going. And look, put a brace on it. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Well, it's hard. It's hard to say that though. Right. If we don't if know if he's, really he's not. Hurt. I don't know the extent of. I don't know the extent played, of his injury. I played the whole mean? season on the on a sprain MCL. So yeah, I understand you know, I mean, if he's not I, I, ready. Whole season. But with Char- a lower Char- body injury, he's going to be up in the press box. He's not going to be on the field for me. Charles. Woo! He wasn't in the press Uh-oh. box either. Woo! He wasn't in Cincinnati. And Jason Lockham Forrest says that's a sign he won't be in Baltimore for long. Your take, Korean Cosell. Hey, Whitlock, you know what this is right here? This is the code. (laughs) Michael Vick ain't on it. Wow. (laughs) Didn't Michael Vick on your show when you were at the other network basically say about Colin Kaepernick, cut your hair, look a little bit more respectable? I am – Michael – Michael Vick, you are outspoken. Wow. You truly are fearless. Get him one of these hoodies because he, he earned it. He, it's like a Letterman jacket. He earned it. Uh, and here's the thing that gets me. Michael Vick's a player. He's allowed to have his opinion. It's probably the minority opinion because you're not allowed to criticize certain players and everyone is pocket watching and we have to care like we are their financial advisors. I see this a lot in boxing. I guarantee you guys like Sammy Watkins and Michael Vick are probably not the only ones who feel that way, but they do not want the backlash that now that Mr. Vick is getting. But Michael Vick, maybe he's pretty toughened up. Maybe he says, after all I've been through, I don't give a damn. But here's here's the issue with RG3 now being like this uh, flag bearer for this. I remember that game, his rookie year, they get out to a 14-0 lead. Now, this is after he had already been knocked out of a game and missed some time. Kirk Cousins comes in and plays pretty well that last month or so. And, Jason, I remember me and you were tweeting at each other way back when, and I'm thinking to myself, as he's hobbling, I'm thinking Shanahan needs to take him out of the game. But I remember the narrative being RG3 actually didn't want to come out of the game because he wanted to do his own in-game version of Willis Reed, and he didn't want to be Wally Pipp by Kirk Cousins. Am I remembering that incorrectly? No, you're not. Thousand percent accurate. Right. So don't, don't make it sound like it's like, hey, um, hey, Robert, even though you're dragging your leg um, and you're limping like a one-legged pirate with a wooden leg, get out there. I don't remember it that way. I just remember there being a lot of pressure internally from RG3 saying, you know what, I can't give up my spot. Here's another thing with RG3. Um, You never evolved as a pocket quarterback. You never got better at the sport of football at that level. A lot of quarterbacks, once they lose, like Randall Cunningham had various injuries. By the end of his career, he could operate in the pocket, and he was very effective, had some big years, especially in Minnesota, 1998. 
So I just think it's really bad. Look, whether you agree or disagree with Michael Vick or Sammy Watkins, that's fine. We're never going to agree in lockstep with everything. But guys who play the game are having a differing opinion. And you know what? Um, they are allowed to have that. And I will say this. As it relates to Lamar, who's been a very admirable figure, you rolled the dice and you gambled. I'm not saying you lost, but you didn't come up with the, you know, the double sixes. You, you didn't roll craps or whatever. You didn't win completely. You're still going to get paid well, but for him not to even travel, Jay, I don't know how you couch that. That, that just, to me, it doesn't sit well. It's a bad look. Well, Lock and, Lock and Forrest says the relationship's so bad that he's not going to return to Baltimore. And so I, I'm at, okay. if, you're, if you're some AFC South team, I think that's who he speculated, or NFC, I can't remember who he speculated, in AFC South. Or, if you're some other NFL franchise, what are you willing to pay? Lamar Jackson coming off a knee injury coming yeah. off of Jason, just didn't what, even travel to Baltimore, didn't play. What are you paying What are you paying Lamar? Well, here's the issue. And I'm sure anyone that had a mother always heard this. Hey, if your friend jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? And the answer is obviously no. But just because the Cleveland Browns made a reckless decision to guarantee every single dollar of Deshaun Watson's contract, does that mean every other franchise is beholden? to do that to their quarterback, I would disagree. The other thing is, most of the contracts are partially guaranteed. Let's say only 80% of a $250 to $300 million contract is guaranteed. Is that some slap in the face that only 80%? All right, folks, if you care that much, do a GoFundMe campaign so Lamar gets guaranteed his other 20%. I'm just so sick of these people acting like fanagers. OK, the team has a right to watch their own fiscal bottom line. The other issue is Lamar Jackson is a great player, but it has to be a system fit. And certain teams fit better based on their personnel and their style of play. But are you sure that no matter where you sign with Lamar Jackson, that he's plug and play? I'm not sure about that. I, I, we're looking at a different level or a different version of the Kirk Cousins situation, mm. Baltimore is going to hit him with a franchise tag and try to trade him. I don't think mm. there's going to be any trade partners because <laughs> again, you have to trade Lamar and offensive coordinator Greg Roman to wherever he goes. Lamar is a unique player. You well, can't just plug him into whatever system you want right. to play. You need his offensive coordinator or someone willing to run that style of offense as well. They're going to slap a franchise tag on him. He's going to be upset. He wouldn't even come to a game just to stand on the sidelines. With that franchise tag, he's probably not going to come to, to, to play on the franchise tag to, to take the field. To me, Steve, this has always been inevitable. This is where this was headed from the moment, our, uh, the moment Lamar Jackson didn't get an agent. Once he and his mother decided they were going to handle this, this was not going to end well. At the level of money he was seeking, and at his age and his mother's experience level, they can't put that deal together and, and, and they, it's too personal now when, when Lamar's in the room or having the conversation, feelings were inevitably gonna get hurt. And now we're at a point where again, he's friends with these 53 guys in the locker room. And anybody knows, I'm a Lamar Jackson fan, supporter. I've liked everything, that, the way Lamar has handled himself. But it's spinning off the road now. He took a bad bet betting on himself in a game that pretty much guarantees everybody's going to get injured at some point. He took a bad bet, and this thing is spinning out of control. This, we may, this may be the end of Lamar Jackson as a star in the NFL. Mm. He'll continue on in the NFL, but he may never be a star again. 
Jason, his situation with his representation, it reminds me of one of my famous or most favorite hip-hop songs of the early 90s from K-Solo, Your Mom's in My Business. Remember that song? Anyway, um, here's the thing with Lamar. He's only 26. So, but the thing is, there's a physical erosion with his style of play. His value may be diminishing if he does not have that outright ability to be elusive and run away from people. He's certainly not a slow quarterback, but with as many hits as he's taken and the mileage on the odometer, you can kind of argue that it's an older version of 26. Now, the comparison that I would draw, and it's not a, it's not a perfect comparison, would be Steve Young. If, if you saw Steve Young coming from the LA Express to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in his early days with the Niners, his style of play was very helter-skelter. It was about athleticism, scrambling, extending plays, being Superman, running around all over. By the time he got the starting job, uh, taking over fully in, I believe, 1991. But within a year or two, he was passing at a 70% clip in that era, which is unbelievable. And he won MVPs, but he evolved his game. His athleticism at that point was secondary to his ability to slice a defense with his arm. I'm not so sure Lamar Jackson is at that point that if he does not have that mesh point threat and all that other fancy stuff they do with the running game and he gets looks on the backside, which are relatively easy reads, can he actually just handle dropping back 25, 30 times a game against defenses that don't have to really think about or respect his ability to take off? And that because it's a different style of quarterback – you know, my view is this. The best scenario for Lamar and the team, because this has to be a partnership, is that you give Lamar that multi-$100 million, $200, $300 million contract, and you front load it where most of the money or a lot of the money is guaranteed for the first three to four years, and you see where it goes. But if I am a franchise, no matter what I think of Lamar, based on his style of play and where he's at physically and the recent track record where he has not finished either of the last two seasons, I I would not, under any circumstance, give him a six, seven, eight-year deal where every single dollar is guaranteed. It makes no sense. If you're the Ravens, he just skipped your playoff game. Mm, mm, mm. supporting his teammates. If you're the Ravens, do you want him back? <laughs> yes, because he's too important. I, I, You know, look, he's the most important player in that franchise in terms of its identity since Ray Lewis. I, I believe he's that important to that franchise, and you've already built your whole system and style of play around him. Not saying that they didn't have to help him more with more outside threats. I get it. But he's been such an integral part of that franchise, that team, and that community. This is going to feel like that very public, ugly divorce. It really is. I have a question to you, Jason. I was wondering, let's say Harbaugh or Greg Roman, instead of doing that quarterback sneak, just hands the ball off to J.K. Dobbins. They punch it in. They go up, and it felt like a Ravens game all the way up until Sam Hubbard crossed the goal line, right? So the Ravens advanced, and Huntley actually played a really serviceable, solid game. Would Lamar Jackson have played next week? I, I That, to me, was the most fascinating part as they're going down, and I'm thinking, if Baltimore wins, now what does Lamar do? I To me, I was dying to find out, would he have just said, no, I'm good. I don't have a contract. doesn't matter if we go to the Super Bowl. I, I just really think as soon as Sam Hubbard crossed that goal line, Lamar Jackson said, okay, I'm good. I'm good. There are some Ravens players saying that, hey, Lamar couldn't play. He's only 50, 60 percent. He's still limping around the facility. And the whole thought of him playing it was a myth from the get-go. I'm not sure if I buy that. You know, <laughs> guys are beat up at the end of the season. Everybody's limping around or moving, moving not gingerly. I'm not sure what to think of it. Steve, right, I want well, Jason, one final one thought. We got, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. One last thing. Okay, so let's say that's true. Let's go with that. Let's say Lamar is so banged up, he's only 50 to 60% and he can't move. At that point, is he really your best quarterback then? No. I mean, if, if he cannot move and he has no athleticism and he's so diminished with his movement, 
maybe he really shouldn't have played then. There is that argument. Yeah, no, that's that's the argument I'm making. I, I, I want to get one final thought mm-hmm. from you on Mike McDaniel. And you got to be tight here. I want to get to JB. Yeah. Mike McDaniel, uh, to me, for 59 minutes, it was like, man, this is a good look for Mike McDaniel and the Miami Dolphins. Yeah. They go to Buffalo in the cold uh, with their what a third, fourth string quarterback, Skylar Thompson, a Kansas State quarterback that no one saw as an NFL player, and they go toe to toe with Buffalo. Man, hats off to Mike McDaniel. Great look for him. Then, <laughs> as mm. the fourth quarter and kept going on and on and on, and particularly in the last minutes, like they can't get plays in on time. They're blowing timeouts. And now on the most important play of the game, they get a delay of game penalty. No. And, and they, can't, they couldn't get a playoff. Was yesterday's close loss a good look for Mike McDaniel? It was. And by the way, the, 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 that was the worst game management or clock management till the last minute of the Ravens game. But Mike McDaniel, to me, any talk of him losing his job, because there's also whispers about is he really safe, I think it's ridiculous. I think he had a very good first year. They have a question, though, with Tua. Can you rely on him to be your QB1? I'm not sure he can because he's very he's not durable. But, Jason, you take a look at that last set of downs. When they ran the ball, they looked short on TV. They didn't even measure it. If I recall correctly, the referee held up a fist. That means fourth down. So I'm thinking, okay, let's get going here. Let's get to the line. And they had an operations problem the whole time where they had some delay of games. And I'm thinking, guys, this is not that hard. And by the way, Jason, on third and fourth and one, your playbook is really five plays. It's some version of a run or a boot action, play action waggle. So Mr. Fancy had to keep it simple and he had to make it quick. It's a bad look, but I think overall, year one, it is promising, but they still have a Tua question in Miami. I'm going to uh, throw this at JB, but I'll, I'll whet his appetite by asking you. This will sound crazy. Lamar Jackson in a Dolphins uniform throwing to receivers who get open with those big windows like you see in college. Yeah. Because Waddle and Tyree Hill are so fast. Lamar Jackson in Miami. Yes, no, uh, I, stupid yeah. idea. No, I'll, I'll tell you why. You look at all the eye candy they do with the orbit motion, the jet sweeps, and the way they set up the run and then play action, the stuff that Brock Purdy is now doing in San Francisco. Um, and if Lamar has that, still has his legs and you have to respect that mesh point, yes. That's the one place that I would – but again – but if you're Baltimore, you're going to say, look, you're going to have to give me one of those track stars on the outside. If you're not going to give me Tyree Kill, you're going to have to give me Waddle. So you may not have all the pieces, but yes, Lamar Jackson with Mike McDaniel, I'd like to see it. Yes. All right. Thank you, Steve. Great job as always. Uh, guys, I need you all to continue to pay attention. We're going to take a short break. I want to play you the commercial from our roll call event that we're doing at Rocket Town in Nashville, Tennessee on Saturday, April the 15th, 2023. Need you to go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Bearing witness requires courage, not perfection. It's going to be an amazing, an amazing event. Check out uh, our commercial uh, promoting uh, Roll Call. And we'll be back with uh, Jason Brown on the other side. Atheists, the secular world, the culture uses our imperfection, our sins to take, shut up. You, you're, you can't stand on truth. And if all it was was imperfection, it eliminated us from standing on truth, this would be a very quiet place. I'm trying to be as loud as I can and as transparent as I can to try to inspire other men. We know you're imperfect. You know you're imperfect. God's grace and mercy. mercy gives you the right to stand on his truth and to speak that loudly into the culture. We we have to do that. You can look around and say, 
these guys have taken over everything. They own the CDC, the NIH, they got the president. Is transgender surgery for children? Colleges today are nothing but leftist indoctrination centers working fully against the Bible. What's the alternative? So you're gonna stop fighting today and you're gonna let the government raise your kids? And you're gonna turn around and let them chop off your 12 year old daughter's breasts and let them sterilize your son and tell him that he's a girl? And you're gonna let them make the Bible hate speech? You're the last line of defense here because nobody else is gonna do it and God's gonna walk with you. This is literally worth dying for. I'm telling you, so it's like everybody, that's a nice little metaphor. This is it. If there's a hill to die on, this is it. The Overton window has been moved right in front of our children's bedrooms. And there are all types of people that are trying to climb up in the ladder. And every good father should be on his post so that when they peek their head up over the, the window sill, you kick the ladder back down, let them know you, you move on to the other house because we're not playing that around here. Sometimes just standing up, just saying no, we're not going to do that. Not my marriage, not my kids, not my family, not my community, not my church, not my city. Just declaring that, that's victory enough. In prepping his disciples, he tells Peter, he's like, listen, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. We're gonna face some ups and downs in life and we're not gonna always get it together. But if we stay on the path, if we stay chasing after, running after Jesus, running after his way, he's even praying for us. Now, I, I like it when you pray for me, Jason and TJ. I appreciate that, but to have Jesus pray for me, that makes me feel pretty good. When you make it through this sifting process, go back and strengthen your brothers. So we all have a responsibility as men. Once he's delivered me through this, I have a responsibility to go back and bring some other folk out. You do a roll call to just let people know you're not alone, be confident in your position, and we're gonna inspire you. We're gonna eat, fellowship, listen to some music. It's gonna be the first of many roll calls that we do. So we're looking for soldiers. We're gonna put on our best uh, recruiting pitches for our soldiers. Are we watching a realignment take place? An understanding that yes, big government's a problem. Yes, big business is a problem. They're the same problem. The, the Buffalo can't... Bills player. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw how quickly they already had the excuse, right? I mean, that is a, a, a small object, high speed in an unprotected, probably young chest. That's not what this was. And yet, again, what we're up against, the COVID cartel. They were so prepared for that eventuality because they anticipated it. So again, anyway, my feeling on it is that that doesn't matter. You don't have the right. It's it's still experimental use of vaccines. If you want to use the term vaccine, you don't have the right to force. You don't have the right to coerce it. The chances that my father would have been president were very, very high. And that would have been an absolute calamity. Uh, for anybody who was involved in my uncle's death because my uncle, my father knew how to run the FBI, he knew how to run the CIA, he knew where the bodies were buried, and he knew how to investigate things. Doctors didn't know what to do. Uh, they sent her home, uh, saw some neurologists. The first neurologist she saw, baffled, um, said, well, let's, let's have you take the second shot and see how that goes. <laughs> and, and she laughed. She thought the doctor was kidding. So not only did tour, tourism, I mean, tourism was shut down and I was mandated by the government that I had to shut my doors. I can't, I can't do anything. I can't make money. I can't pay my employees. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's an economic death sentence. Welcome back. Let's roll out to Los Angeles again and bring in Coach JB, Jason Brown, Last Chance Q. JB, we're going to start where I somewhat ended with uh, Steve Kim, Lamar Jackson. I want to read uh, to you something Lamar posted uh, earlier today on Instagram. I think this is related to him being a no-show at uh, their game yesterday in Cincinnati. 
Wasn't scheduled to play, but just didn't show up to support his teammates. Uh, Lamar posted on Instagram, when you have something good, you don't play with it. You don't take chances losing it. You don't neglect it. When you have something good, you pour into it. You appreciate it. Because when you take care of something good, that good thing takes care of you too. Uh, Jason Lockham Four is reporting that the, there's a rift in the relationship between the Ravens and Lamar Jackson. He thinks Lamar Jackson will be out of Baltimore, that Baltimore will be forced to franchise tag and then trade Lamar Jackson. Your thoughts on one, Lamar not playing uh, with an MCL injury that's not completely healed and then not showing up to even support his teammates and then do you think Lamar has any trade value with other teams want Lamar Jackson at this point? Uh, the first problem is the the not showing up. I did, it's just becoming a trend. <clears throat> this is what we are now in society. This is what we are. This is what the generation is. We allow it at all levels. Parenting, coaching, players, our peers. We don't really uh, – See, back in the day, Jason, we missed a game or refused to play in a game for whatever uh, reason. We were going to probably probably get in a fight in the locker room with our teammates. Somebody was probably going to check us, come to us, and we were probably going to have to defend that uh, decision. Nowadays, we go on to social media and we praise Lamar Jackson. He's deserving. I wouldn't play either. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just lost right now, man. In this, in this day and age, I'm lost with these kids' decisions on uh, not playing the game. They're making a lot of money playing, uh, more money than we've ever seen, and yet they think it's okay to miss uh, work, which is what it is. It's work, um, and you know, the Walmart worker can't call in every day and miss work. He's going to be fired. I think we, we're so enabled that we take it for granted now, and we don't understand how important this fan base is to our careers and our futures, plus our future contracts, in this case, with Lamar. Uh, I think he, he pulled the ultimate cowardly move. Uh, I think he's what we call a fake-ass good boy. I've called him a uh, good character kid. I know some people that coached him. Now I'm seeing things that we call a fake-ass good boy, Jason. He shakes your hand. He smiles in your face. He calls you yes, sir, no, ma'am. He, he says this and that. And then he goes out and does things like this, which we continue to see lately because he has a riff with contract and, and, and his, and his, and his uh, organization. Jason, we're here to play the game. We have 52 dudes in that locker room depending on you to beat the Bengals, to move on in the playoffs. And apparently, from what I've heard, he was medically cleared. And if you're not going to show up to the game to back up Huntley as far as backing him up emotionally, support, et cetera, then to me, you've shown your cards. You are who I thought you were now. And it's, and it's kind of like, wow. You know, and you saw, you saw Sammy Watkins kind of make a statement like, I don't understand. This guy can play. Why is he not playing? Uh, I'm very confused now that the locker room's starting to get wind of it. I think I said it was Steve Kim. I think he cowered, cowered it out because he didn't want to perform like he normally would in the playoffs and choke and look bad. And it only would hurt his future contract negotiations even more. So if you don't show up now, we got to go back and look at the film and see why we're going to pay this guy. But, but blatant, but black, just get horribly performance in the playoffs. We know we're not paying him. So why should I show up for that? I've already proven who I am. I, I can't win in the playoffs. I'm not sustainable in this league as a quarterback, and that is proven. And now he wants his money too. It's like, come on, man. You're, you're, you're who I said you are all year long. So, uh, Jason, I just want to ask you, when when do I get my pat on the back? <laughs> let's get through the off season. Let's let's see what happens this off season before you get your pat on the back. But hey, Jason, let me I, ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Where does he go? Let me ask you that. Where does he go? Who is that right? Mind? That's where I'm at. That's what I. You're here to answer that question. Where does he go? That was my question to you. 
Where does who would who wants Lamar Jackson at this point? Don't you have to trade for him and Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator? Just like I said on my show today, Greg Roman is so undervalued, it's unbelievable. If you're not a football guy and don't understand football and you don't understand coaching and the intricacies of coaching, you will never understand how truly great Greg Roman is. He's been to multiple Super Bowls as an offensive play caller using multiple offensive scheme that nobody wants to talk about. He's created and devised a system for a guy to be successful. And he's created a, a system – to be condu to for to be conducive in this in with this guy who limit is very limited throwing the football. So we got to create all these bells and whistles in the run game to have success. Jason, they face a bear front more than any NFL team has faced in the last twenty years, and you know as a player, a bear front for all the nas- non, you know the, the 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 general population out there, the novice fan, is when we cover up every offensive lineman with a D lineman. And we bring in two linebackers. That's a seven-man line of scrimmage. And we get cover zero or one high in the secondary. That tells me, and all the whistles are belling, we, 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 we think you are going to choke passing the football. We're going to pressure receivers, load the box, so you don't beat us with your feet because we know you can't beat us with your arm. They face the bare front so much, Jason, And I love seeing these naysayers on Twitter. Greg Roman needs to go. Really? Do you know what he does in the bare front, Jason? He he has innovated um, schematics in the run game where they are are adding a hat to the box to help out Lamar. They're, They're down in the guard, wrapping the center and backside tackle, reading the backside DN, things we never saw years ago because a lot of people, as you know as a player, Jason, you see a bare front, you check out. We throw the ball. We can't run against the bare front. Roman's running the football versus bare front because they've had to create all these schematics with floating motions and adding guys to the party just to throw, just to run the ball with this guy to be successful and have a great, have a somewhat of a decent offense in a system where you have no receivers because receivers don't want to play with you because you can't throw the ball. And I got to be able to run the football and play defense and not turn the ball over. And my pr- my point is this, Jason. Huntley should have won the game last night. And a very average quarterback, a backup in this league, which I've been saying on your show for 12 weeks, we can win with average quarterbacks around a better roster. And Huntley proved it last night. They should have won the football game with average play. They look better in the red zone yesterday than they have with Lamar Jackson all season. I mean, let that sink in. Can I go back to my question? Who wants Lamar Jackson? No, I don't. Nobody. Because you got to restructure your whole roster. You got to structure your whole roster. You have to become Baltimore South. So who's going to become Baltimore South? New Orleans with Kamara? Or are you going to go to Tennessee and play with that running back and Derrick no Henry? Derrick Henry. With, with Henry with no receivers again. I mean, I'm just confused. Who's going to take you? Washington? The Jets? Jets have too many good receivers to waste. Washington has McCarran. There's too many good receivers to waste. Like, who is going to restructure their entire roster around this guy who hasn't won in the playoffs very much, who hasn't been sustainable as far as playing with this style? What team are you going to – what team, if you're the GM, Jason, who's going to take them? The, The Raiders? Hell no. He ain't going to get the ball to Devontae Adams. Miami? So you think Tyreek Hill and Waddle are going to be happy with him coming to Miami? Hell no. They can't get him the ball. So they already struggle with Tua. So I, I'm just saying, I don't see a team. I don't see a home for the guy, man. I think he's really, really gambled on himself, which I admire. But I think it's a bad business decision. That's why you don't hire siblings, blood, mothers, fathers as your agent i think he really screwed the pooch in this one man i i i really like the kid i i you know i he's shown some bad judgment lately and i i have no respect for the kid at, at this point unless there's something i don't know and I, I hate to speak outside of my mouth and and put my foot in my mouth but i would have showed up to the game regardless because you've been there for these guys your whole time now you're starting to feel sorry for yourself and and they should they should come kiss your behind 
No, you should be there as a leader and as a guy looking for a big bag and show up and say, you know what? I'm bigger than what they say. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show up for my team. I mean, that's to me, man, we're be, this is becoming allowed more than often. And the more we allow it, what, the more you're be next year. How, how about Aaron Rodgers don't show up next year? I mean, it's expected now. JB, hold on. I want to stay on this Lamar topic. What should, not what would JB do, what should, although this is what JB would do, what should the Baltimore Ravens do? Should they franchise tag Lamar? Should they move on from Lamar? Should they give him a long-term contract? What should Baltimore do? I move on from him, and at this point, I got to start questioning the hardball. Uh, you know, Mr. Hadley sent me a little interesting stat for my show. He's got two wins in 10 years in the playoffs. Hardball. Well, nobody's talking about him pacing the sideline, really not doing anything but being the figurehead of the program. He doesn't call offense. He doesn't call defense. He's a special teams guy by nature. And his demeanor on the sideline is really just, it's not that, it's not going to do nothing for anyone like a Lamar Jackson. So he's created this offensive scheme. The RG3s, the, the, the McSorley's, uh, the Huntley's. Their whole program is built around Lamar Jackson. So if Lamar goes down, the backup would, was, at one point was RG3. Let's run the same system. McSorley was his backup. Let's run the same system. We don't have the traditional quarterback to come in and, and be the pocket guy. This whole offense was devised around Lamar Jackson, which I give Harbaugh credit for. I love that he went out on a limb and said, we're going to build this thing around Greg Roman and Lamar Jackson, and let's go win this way. Pound, 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 play defense, and – Use this electrifying superstar at quarterback as an athlete. Well, now it has imploded on you, and your roster now lacks in so many key areas. I do not see, Jason, a GM or an owner paying Lamar this amount of money when you lack at on the perimeter at receiver, where you, when you lack at a couple D-line pieces, maybe a secondary piece for Peters, who's get aging tremendously in front of our very eyes. They got to get back to Baltimore Ravens football that won them a Super Bowl with the most average quarterback ever to win a Super Bowl and Trent Dilfer. So that is where I'm at. You can't put all this in in, in Lamar or, or you're going to be where you are right now just with the Lamar Jackson contract. What did you think of J.K. Dobbins' criticism of the quarterback sneak saying he, he should have gotten the ball? I don't know. This is my thing. I had Zach Smith on my show this morning. He, he kind of knows a lot about him. He said he's done that before. J.K. Dobbins has fumbled, too. And the same scenario, fumbled on the goal line just like this. Um, so it's kind of ironic how people forget their own hap doings and mishaps. Um, here's my thing. I give credit to a kid all the time. I'm always going to credit a kid who's given his all out especially in a situation where Lamar Jackson is basically not showing up, doesn't want to play for our team. I believe the Ravens really rallied behind Huntley yesterday. They wanted to play for that dude. And some of the effort plays I, I witnessed from Huntley, I just, as a coach, uh, I just, I, I, I love seeing it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to question the situation. It was unfortunate. They probably win the game. Uh, probably win the, I wouldn't, I, I still think Burrow goes down and scores with that much time left, no doubt. But at the same time, I still think they could have won the game. Not, probably 90% probable they win. So I feel for Huntley doing that. But at the same time, why wasn't Dobbins pushing Huntley in? Why wasn't he the guy pushing him in from the back? See, that's the that's where you find out where these team guys are and where these I guys are. Mm, and Baltimore, I'm on defender. Huntley went airborne. It's hard to push a guy that went airborne. He was supposed to burrow in low, allow yeah. some. Huntley broke protocol. Let, let me just because, according to Last Chance, you, uh, Jason Brown's a guy that got into some beefs, shouting matches with referees on a regular basis. I wanted your take on Sean Smith and the officiating crew in that Chargers game. But, but we got a clip here of Sean Smith going after Joey Bosa. And, and we see this in, we, we see this 
in baseball where an umpire may chase after a player or a manager or whatever, but I just don't remember seeing this in football where a player says something and is walking to the sideline and the ref goes and hunts him down and continues the argument, escalates it. This seems completely unusual, uncalled for, unprofessional. This is the same referee that cost the Chiefs a game early in the season for flagging Chris Jones for disturbing language towards Matt Ryan. Your take on just the officiating the NFL and this in particular. Officiating's been bad all over the place. We got a we got an officiating shortage across America, by the way, at all levels. So there's an officiating shortage. It's because of the helicopter parents in the stands. It's because of the coaches, even like myself. I'm not gonna ever I, I, I was hard on the referees as well, but I also took care of the referees in the off season um, with different things that we did as far as showcases and clinics. Um, they would all tell you that, but I am hard on them in a game because again, I'm, I'm coaching for my players. Uh, I would like to see the coach Staley on the refs harder than the player, because my thing is this, Jason players shut the hell up. You play, I'll get on the refs because when they, when the players do it, Jason is, this is what you have. You have an unruly setting and you give up a 27 point lead because your players have no respect for the head coach and you don't shut the hell up. Let me get on the refs as the head coach. Number one. Number two is I don't actually disagree. I don't really, I'm not really a big, uh, I'm not really hating this referee for doing what he did because of this reason, Jason. I don't know what he said. I don't know what Bosa told him. And at what point are we going to just continue to take it and take it and take it? How? What if Bosa told him, screw your mother or something? It's a natural reaction to go say, you know what, man? You're out of line. Why don't you be quiet and play? Like if the ref said that, I have no issue because at some point we're going to have to put a, a stop to these players talking so much to the refs. NBA has created the biggest – it's the biggest joke ever. These these NBA players talk to these refs however they want, and everyone sees this on a national scale. And you know how many players do this in football? But guess what we're protected with? A helmet. You don't see our mouth. You don't know what we say. That is also why we lack endorsements and other things that NBA players get over NFL players. We have a helmet. You don't know half the league anyway. Half the novice fan don't even know who the hell most offensive linemen, defensive linemen are if they walked in Walmart next to you. You don't even know who they are. So you don't know what they're saying in those helmets. So I don't know what happened there. So I don't want to speak out of turn and don't and, and put my foot in my mouth. If he did say something out of line, I don't I'm not very mad at the ref for doing what he did. Now you said unprofessional. Could be. I don't know what their real protocols are as far as bylaws. Do you chase down a player or not? That's where I know you're going, which I see your point on that too. Um you know, you don't know what he said, and I just, I'm glad he called him out. Gotcha. Uh, Fair take. Yeah. Fair take. I like a little disagreement, a little dissent. Uh, you also kind of segue into my last question for you. Uh, I figured you'd have a take. Brandon Staley calls up a 27-point lead, man. Is, is, should, should he be fired? Would you retain Brandon Staley, or is it time to get – Justin Herbert, uh, an offensive coach and just a better coach than Brandon Staley. Let me go back to, let me go two things on this. Sean Payton is in LA. He's been in LA for three weeks. That's number one. So you have this guy out here who everyone's flying into LA to interview. Houston um, is coming in here today to speak to him. Denver flying into L.A. to speak to him tomorrow uh, due to legalities of his contract. Um, So the the Chargers have to fire Staley by tonight in order to be in those sweepstakes. If they wait a week, they're probably not going to get him, number one. So if you do fire him, you better do it tonight. Now, as to my take on what to do, first of all, I think Herbert is getting far too much credit for their or not to let me put it this way he's not getting enough blame and staley's getting far too much credit in this 27-0 
comeback law uh, give up yes or the other day. Herbert did absolutely nothing in the second half. Nothing. He showed up and was a nobody again. He has yet to win a playoff game. When are we going to start calling this guy the next Ryan Leaf? Because this guy's a big old, pretty, gorgeous, 6'6", 240-pound guy who can throw the ball all over the place. He hasn't won a playoff game. You know who has? Brock Purdy. Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence just won his first one. I mean, when are we going to start saying, hey, Herbert, when are you going to show up and earn your money? Staley should never have been the head coach, in my opinion. With a Herbert, a guy like Herbert, you have to have an offensive coach. So I believe Sean Payton is salivating over coaching the kid. I think Sean Payton can get the most out of the kid if anybody can. So contrary to the belief of Sean Payton has come out on woke networks and PC networks and said, I like Kyler Murray. No, you don't. You said that so you can get behind a mic on a mainstream media and you want to say the things everyone likes. You ain't going to come out and say, there's no way I want to coach Kyler Murray. Because I know for a fact he don't want to coach Kyler Murray. He'd rather have Josh Herbert or Matt Stafford. And I think that McVay threw a monkey wrench in this whole thing because he came back. Uh, some inside sources I had said that he w- that Sean Payton was headed to the Rams and McVay was going to step down and go into the press box and to the media world. That threw a monkey wrench on him. That's why Sean's been out here so long. And now this has happened. So now maybe a job that he didn't expect, the Chargers, may end up being the one he ends up taking. But I believe he was going to end up in L.A. regardless. I think he still does. Now, if Dallas loses tonight, Sean Payton may be in those sweepstakes. But Staley has to go for the simple fact of Josh, Her- I mean, of Herbert being a guy that's underachieved for being such a freak of nature that he is. Um, I put him in the same in the same boat, Jason, as Mahomes and Josh Allen. Those guys are freaks of nature. They're all unbelievable talents. But to this day, in my opinion, they've all been uh, overrated. They've all been overrated. Here you go. Here you go. Mahomes about to get his love, second love, MVP, and he's I overrated. The, uh, I Number love one the seed headed towards us. Probably his third Super Bowl, but yeah, overrated. I, I hear it. you, JB. I love it. Hey, I, I hear you. Hey, two uh, touchdowns yeah, and two ahead. Super Bowls. Two touchdowns and two Super Bowls. Four picks. He's the goat. <laughs> <laughs> JB, I'm done with you. Great job as always. All Thank right. you. Uh, we're gonna play some tomorrow, and tomorrow we got an awesome, awesome awesome show for you tell all your friends if you want to hear a conversation about the vaccine vaccine mandates vaccine injuries how we should react to the covid pandemic and the way that it was handled we got you covered tomorrow all these people in studio with us tomorrow robert kennedy jr that's bobby kennedy's son Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin in studio with us. John Stockton, NBA legend, in studio right here with us in Nashville. Nick Rolovich, former head football coach at Washington State, run out of that job over the COVID vaccine. Uh, Ken Maurer, former NBA uh, referee, longtime NBA referee, he's coming back in studio with us. Chris Singleton, former Major League Baseball player, Steve Kaplan, a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. Steve Dace is going to be here. Ken Rutgers, former first-round draft pick of the Green Bay Packers. Beth Faber, longtime ESPN reporter. And our main man, Steve Dace, is also going to be here to give us some expertise, foremost authority on COVID and the pandemic. He's written another book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich. He wants Nuremberg trials for Fauci and everybody involved in this COVID pandemic. We're gonna go about three hours tomorrow, breaking down all of this COVID madness. Tell all your friends, family, be educational, be interesting, it'll be some of our best work. 
Uh, so we'll see you tomorrow.